When it comes to making more power with just about any engine, forced induction is an obvious solution. But there are a variety of options when it comes to forced induction. We're here with Eric from Procharger to talk about centrifugal superchargers. Now Eric, before we dive into the world of centrifugal superchargers, can you just give us the sort of 30,000 foot view of the options available in terms of forced induction that are out there today? Well, I mean, obviously they could do a screw, a roots, a turbo. I mean, there's any any way to shove air into a motor. Obviously, a Procharger is a centrifugal supercharger. And I'm just stoked about what we've been able to accomplish in the last you know, about 30 years. Really pushing the envelope of what's possible. Definitely, the technology has come a, a long way. Now, before we dive a little further in, let, let's actually back up a stage. And yep. you've, you've mentioned the root style and screw style blowers. And, and these are really common, particularly in the V8 market, because from a packaging standpoint, that's nice. They fit in the valley, yep. and, and that's pretty easy. So that's one style of supercharger. Then you also mentioned turbocharging. And I, I like to sort of compare superchargers, of centrifugal superchargers and turbochargers because there are a lot of similarities there. So let us know what those are. Well, they're yeah, they're so similar because they actually kind of started in the same place. Like back in the day of the warbirds in the sky, you had centrifugal supercharged big, you know, V12s, V16s that eventually got mechanical turbos that eventually became turbo supercharged. So it's actually, they all started in the same spot. Um, obviously, when they diverged was when the one was exhaust driven only and we're primarily crankshaft driven uh, belt or direct drive. So, so when we look at a centrifugal supercharger, essentially the compressor side of this looks identical to a turbocharger and for all intents and purposes it is? Uh, very similar. Uh, the difference would be RPM at which it operates at. So turbocharger, I mean, small ones can be upwards of 200,000 RPM. Uh, your bigger race ones are probably in the 180 to 100,000 RPM range. And we like to stick for gearbox purposes uh, about 75, well, take that back. We like to stay about 75,000 and lower. Obviously racers do what racers do. They push that envelope a little bit. So the compressor design has to take that RPM limitation into effect. So you're optimized the compressor design so that it's efficient and works well with that 75,000 RPM speed in mind? Yes, correct, that's exactly it, yep. Okay, and, and you've sort of already alluded to the fact that this is really a limitation just around the design of the gearbox. You, you can't really drive the, the compressor at the sort of speeds a turbocharger is used to seeing? Right, because a, a turbocharger is gonna be floating that shaft on oil where we actually have gears and shafts internal to that. So on planet Earth, there's actually not a lot of gearboxes spinning 100,000 RPM. It's not a common thing. I mean, I mean obviously your transmission's not doing that. It's Again, I think there's like natural gas turbines or something that do that, and then us. Um, what's been great is over the years, uh, machining technologies, bearing technology, uh, gear and shaft materials all have evolved, obviously. You know, racing keeps pushing that envelope, and we keep adapting to it and making sure that gearbox can keep getting faster and faster and durable and more durable. All right. Yeah. <laughs> This always becomes a contentious topic because those who love their screw style blowers will will argue that they're the best. The turbo team are doing the same in, in their corner and then yeah, oh of yeah. course supercharged. And, and the reality is that they have their own sets of pros and cons. Now in terms of the efficiency alone, if we can just focus on that for a moment, if we look at a, a common screw style blower, they've come a long way over the, the last sort of few decades, but mm -hmm. essentially uh, for the same amount of boost pressure, uh, they're not as efficient as a centrifugal blower, can we can say that? Yes, that is usually the case. I mean honestly that is our benefit. Uh, is the efficiency, if packaged correctly with the correct motor, correct camshaft, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, you could screw that up. You could run the wrong compressor and you'd have a mess. But we like to make sure that when a customer calls in, you give us all the information about your motor. I mean, everything you can tell us. And I can guarantee I've got a compressor that is basically perfect for that. And if we find that there's a niche uh, that maybe we don't, we'll build it. And, and, and that, that's what we've always done. That's why, I'm, that's why I have a lot of blowers on display. Not everybody understands the differences of them. They look similar. Uh, from the outside, you might tell, not be able to tell the two apart. However, like let's say at 600 horsepower, there might be a 20% efficiency difference be, between those two. So 
In terms of that efficiency, because let's follow on from that and what it actually means. When we compress air, no matter how well we do it, by definition, physics dictates that we're going to introduce more heat. Yep. But depending exactly how efficient the compressor is in its operation, uh, we can end up adding more heat if that compressor is inefficient Correct. compared to an efficient one. And the knock-on effect there is for the same pre boost pressure, we're going to have more or less power depending on the efficiency. Absolutely. So that's one of the things that, you know, everybody gets hung up on a boost number. And uh, you can make a lot of boost, but if you made a lot of heat with it, you're kind of negating the whole point, you know. So the good thing is, again, an efficient compressor. We also have great intercoolers. Well, you com combine both of those. Most of the time, most of our kits are back down within, I don't know, 10 degrees of ambient, somewhere around there. So it makes a lot of horsepower. All right, let, let's talk about the differences now between a turbocharger and a centrifugal supercharger because as we've already discussed, essentially on the compressor side of things we've got a very similar technology. Yep. You've mentioned there are differences in the compressor design based on the operating RPM but obviously the turbocharger is exhaust driven, the centrifugal supercharger is belt or crank driven? Yeah, belt or crank for us in most cases. Uh, so with the turbocharger, especially on pump fuel, obviously it's now introduced back pressure, which is gonna dictate how you build your timing curve. Um, again, turbochargers have come a long way and they are doing better than ever, just like we are. But if you're talking about a streetcar guy that's running pump gas or he's octane limited, uh, there are some key areas where we have some great advantages because we can let the car run basically its normal timing torque ratio that it wants to run before we start inducing a bunch of airflow because we have not put any restriction on it. So as far as the exhaust side of the engine is concerned, it's operating like an aspirated engine? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And the thing that we've seen most recently is people are now changing their minds. They're not talking about camshafts being a turbo camshaft or a supercharged camshaft. Or that, that's finally kind of going away. People just now realize that treat the motor as an air pump. Mm get air in, get air out, and just make the most horsepower you can. And this moves a little off topic, but when we are speaking a camshaft, that exhaust back pressure that we see with a turbocharger is a big factor on, on the, the cam that we would choose. But right, uh, you're sort so of a, on the centrifugal side. Because again, you've got basically naturally aspirated as far as the engine's concerned on the exhaust side. Okay, let's talk about the way the, the centrifugal supercharger works in terms of its boost curve, because this is one area that is substantially different uh, to an exhaust driven turbocharger. So what's, what's a typical boost curve look like? Well, I mean, the, the easy and short of it is you could draw like a 45 degree angle because I mean like if we had a very radial compressor that's what it's going to do. It's going to be very linear from start to finish. Now that doesn't hold true for most of our newer compressor designs because again they're more of, uh, I mean we'll call them almost like a turbo style wheel. It's kind of is what it is. Very laid back blade, uh, a lot more protrusion out into the inducer and we actually are relying a lot more on compressor RPM. So if you sized the compressor incorrectly, you would have a big lull before that blade came up to speed and really moved into that efficiency zone. Again, we work with the customer to make sure that that doesn't happen. So that way we get an impeller that starts out at that 45 and actually tapers in a lot harder if that's what they would like it to do. But essentially, all other things being equal, we're never going to have 20 psi of boost just off idle. No. It, it's going to be that somewhat linear curve because the, the compressor speed is obviously driven uh, either directly or indirectly by a crankshaft speed. Right, and honestly, I don't want 20 pounds of boost at idle. It's ridiculously hard on rods and pistons. You can't run any timing at that point. You're gonna have to pull so much timing out of it. Uh, you're almost gonna negate a lot. So. Truly a small amount of boost, I mean even a screw does have that kind of curve, they, they gain as RPM gains. So having a lower amount of RPM boost at a low piston speed or rod speed is not really a bad thing. Um, again, as long as it has a properly built timing table, you can really optimize that. And let's talk about variable cam timing, that's really changed the game and helped us there too. So we can make a really a lot of robust torque by moving the cams into different positions and putting like let's say two or three pounds of boost down low so we haven't uh, exceeded the cylinder pressure that the octane of the fuel could handle. 
In terms of driver feel, essentially, you're because you're crankshaft driven, zero lag. When you get into the throttle, the turp, the compressor is already at whatever speed the, it's dictated by the the crankshaft speed. So, zero lag is, is this essentially going to feel from the driver's foot pedal like a bigger capacity naturally aspirated engine? That's how. That's uh, yeah. That's exactly what everybody always said. It, it takes a big block and makes it feel like it's twice a big block, right? It's a very linear power band and that's probably the number one reason why we're selling more race blowers than ever before because racers especially at the 4,000 horsepower level I know this sounds crazy they need a drivable linear power curve uh, something that hits hard right at the very beginning they're obviously trying to reel in all that power and then try to put it back in uh, where our curve is actually now starting to fit pro mods more naturally than ever before because it's a usable power band from start to finish. All right, let, let's talk a little, about, a little bit about the uh, complexities around fitting a, a pro charger to a, to a vehicle. Uh, obviously, you need to get access to something to drive it. So you're somewhat limited in where in the engine bay this, this supercharger is likely to be able to fit, correct? Yeah, yep, we are. We obviously in most cases, except for a few exceptions, we are driving off the front uh, accessory drive. Now what we've done is we obviously can do driver side mount, passenger side mount. We've done a lot of reverse mounts lately where the blower actually is flipped around the other direction, got cold air facing forward. It really just depends on the engine bay of the vehicle. Um, the other thing that we've spent a lot of time on is again intercooling to make sure that again they're getting back down or as close to ambient as possible. And we've spent a lot of time educating people that you know, even if the air filter is in the engine bay, it's actually not as detrimental as some people might actually think. The reality is, is the intercooler cools it back down. If there's not that much heat load, once a car's moving one mile an hour, two mile an hour, there is a lot of airflow through an engine bay. And one of the, the concerns, of course, with any belt driven supercharger is the belt failing, falling yep. off, becoming right. loose, slipping, what, whatever that may be. And obviously in competition, that's not ideal. Uh, what, what is needed in order to combat that? What are the complexities around making sure that element is reliable? Well, so back in the day, just like everybody, we would rely on like factory tensioners or something uh, another company made as a tensioning device. Um, here, in, I don't know, in the last couple of years, we just went to build our own. So. For a streetcar guy that's running an eight rib or a six rib or an eight rib or a 10 rib belt, we now manufacture the tensioner ourselves. It has a huge range of travel and it obviously is a very tight tensioner. So it's gonna apply a lot of force without exceeding what the crankshaft can handle, um, which has changed the game. I mean, now on our belt driven stuff, I wanna say eight rib stuff is now approaching 1400 horsepower, fairly reliable on like the Mustang platforms and stuff, 10 ribs even a little further than that. Is the limit here in terms of how much power is required to actually drive the supercharger as you approach these higher boost airflow uh, sort of regions? Uh, it's actually that RPM and belt stretch. Um, what a lot of people didn't take into account was as you keep upping in power, the belt stretches over time and a lot, a lot of times the tensioner would run out of travel. So it's putting pressure in, pressure, pressure, and then it hits its stop. Well, then the belt goes slack and then that's game over. So again, uh, once you've exceeded what a belt can handle because of the drive power, then we'd recommend, you know, we have like the Gilmer style belts uh, or cog, if some people call them that. And then for guys that are 2000 horsepower and above, honestly, most of them are now going to a either a reverse belt drive that's very short or they're going to a crank drive blower. And that that has been the game changer for all the big, big well, 2000, 3000, 4000 horsepower setups. A crank drive makes a, a lot of sense. One of the, the questions I've got around that is how then do you adjust the uh, blower speed to affect boost pressure? I mean obviously if a belt drive you can change the size of a pulley and change the, the drive ratio between yep. crankshaft and supercharger. Not quite so simple on a crank drive? It's actually really easy. I'll actually show you over here since we have one on display. So we can change the blower speed in about five minutes. So we actually have an uh, intermediate gearbox that goes right between the crank and right between the blower. It actually uses, we wanted to make sure it was industry standard, easy stuff. So the gears inside are just gears out of a quick change rear end. Quick change rear ends don't blow up. They run a lot of horsepower through them and they have almost zero reliability issues. So we made a bearing structure that could work within that RPM, uh, whatever, use range. And then therefore that's what then speeds up the blower. So all you did is eliminate the belt, turned it into gears. 
makes a lot of sense, gets rid of a potential failure point. Now, before we came on camera, you did mention some of the advances with modern cars these days and how they're actually helping uh, centrifugal superchargers essentially do a better job. And this is around gearing. So tell us what you're talking about here. Well, in the last, uh, I don't know, let's say 10 years, six-speed trannies came around. Then there was seven, some seven-speeds, eight-speeds, and now the 10-speeds have become very common on most of the performance muscle cars. And what's great about those transmissions is you can't have more than half throttle before it's automatically going to downshift and put you way up in the RPM. It's going to put it in our sweet spot, as I'd like to call it. We're going to live in the upper RPM range with very small RPM drops on gear changes. So it's no shocker to everyone. We make peak torque very high up in the RPM range. So if you're in a car and you just put your foot more than halfway down, you just went to the point where we make the most torque, which is wonderful. So the high gear count really just gets around the fact that the centrifugal supercharger, the boost comes up slowly, you're straight away in the meat of the, the power band as soon as you put your foot down. Yep, absolutely. I mean, somebody the other day was like, what do you do about something at 2,500 RPM? And I was like, well, your vehicle won't ever be at 2,500 RPM. You drive a Chevy truck. It's actually impossible to be at full throttle at 2,500 RPM. And he's like, oh yeah, I didn't even think about that. So it was perfect. All right, thanks for your time there. Great to, to learn a little bit more about centrifugal superchargers and hopefully that's broken down some uh, misconceptions and misunderstandings for our viewers. Thanks for your time there, Eric. Now, actually, if people do want to find out more about Procharger, how are they best to do that? Uh, Procharger.com. Uh, we have a lot of resources on the website. we got downloadable... Uh you know, uh, brochures that go into a lot of tech. Otherwise, just pick up the phone. You can call us anytime. We'll be glad to answer any question you got. Perfect. Thanks a lot. No problem. Thank you. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.